are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuel Ettini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to this new episode. Today, we are going to discuss a crucial issue, personal mobility and a key enabler, recharging, because that is where the stakes are. And we have an expert with us. We have Tom Hust, who is the UK lead and business network development manager for Fastnet. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Thanks very much for having me, Samuele. It's really a pleasure to have you, especially to discuss a crucial problem about how to transform the the mobility sector in the wake as well of the pledges and the UN decade of action, because we know all that the planetary boundaries are already passed and we need to work. Maybe, Tom, if you can tell us before starting and going into the problem and your solution, a little bit about yourself. How have you joined this challenge? How have you been a change maker in the sustainability, broader sustainability industry? From a very young age, I was always interested in renewable energy and, and those kinds of concepts. I went to university, I studied mechanical engineering, and then in significant naivety, I would say, I joined the oil and gas industry, thinking this is an area that's you know clearly responsible for this, the, the greater portion of greenhouse gases across the world. And that if you want to make a change, this is the place to make the change. As soon as I got into the oil and gas industry, I realized, ooh, okay, to make a change, I think I need to be in a slightly different position. So <laughs> I, I am, you know, after drilling a few oil wells, basically, literally, there are some oil wells in the desert with my name on them pretty much. I then retrained, took more time to really formalize my education in the the fast growing field of of renewable energy, sustainable energy, and and everything all around that. I then joined an energy and climate change consultancy, and I spent six years advising governments, cities, you know, national governments, local governments, large multinationals on um, various elements of climate change strategy, energy strategy related to low carbon issues, whether that's um, mobility, heating in particular, energy generation. And I guess through that role, it became clear to me at the time, this was the sort of um, the late 2000s, the renewable energy generation or re- renewable electricity generation part of the puzzle, I, you know, I would still argue that's largely been solved. We know where we stand with wind power, with renewable uh, electricity, and it's a case of rolling that out, scaling it up. The technology is there. It's, it's just fantastic categorically. I saw a lot of other challenges. So heating is a, a major challenge or heating and cooling across the world. A lot of that is still very much fossil fuel driven. But this was a, call that a difficult challenge. I couldn't see how I could add much more value to that at, at that time. But what I did see coming along was, was transportation. Transport in globally speaking, depending on how you formulate this, it's responsible for 25 to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. And I could see what was happening with electromobility and that the change that was you know, due to come and the scale of the industry was such that there was a role for me to get involved at the start of it help make a difference and move from what I was doing before, which was writing very good looking reports, uh, which would go and sit on someone's you know, shelf for the rest of their lives, to actually being involved in delivery of infrastructure. So I, I joined a company called Fastnet uh, in 2017. Fastnet itself was actually set up in uh, 2012, 2013, with the goal of providing freedom for electric car drivers. And really what Fastnet does is it, I like to say anyway, we, we build petrol stations, but for electric cars. And so we install high power chargers um, under solar canopies on high traffic locations and using energy from the grid, which is powered by renewable energy. It's not all from what we install. We get you on the road again as quickly as possible, such that by using infrastructure like what we build, you know when you drive an electric car, you can drive all around Europe uh, with the same comfort and freedom that you have when you drive a petrol or diesel car today. Uh, That's the mission. That is great. So from digging wells and taking out fossil fuel, going towards being a, an enabler of the transformation of the transport and the mobility sector through the recharging and especially uh, fast recharging. Can you go a bit deeper about your solution and which problems are you trying to tackle with Fastnet? Obviously, the, the key problem that we have is, you know, 
certainly historically as well, electric vehicles, when Fastnet was founded, their average range was about 80 miles or so. So if you wanted to carry out a decent journey, you know, uh, for vacation, for work, whatever it might be, you needed to have the ability to continue it after the end of that 80 mile period. And sort of at that time, the fastest charging would, would take, you know, um, anywhere between six and 12 hours to fill your car. So it's not practical if you want to have that same level of freedom as you have today with traditional vehicles, let's say. So the DC charging technology that came along, so DC charging is a form of, uh, obviously I refer to, to DC uh, direct current electricity, is a, the means by which you can fill the battery of the electric vehicle very quickly. And our founders uh, saw uh, the potential for this. Uh, one of them had already had a role at a company that was producing these DC chargers. And they saw that the next important part of the equation was where do you install this? How do you install this? And how do you build it in such a way that it's future-proofed and scalable and able to grow with the market? The business started by securing 200 locations on the Dutch motorways. And so we have the ability to develop those over the next 15 years, installing more and more chargers in simple terms. And, and also more importantly, making sure that we're focusing on the customer experience of charging. You know, obviously you can install a charger around the back of a, a petrol station car park. You can install a charger in a multi-story car park if it can be hidden somewhere. But one of the key things that we seek to do beyond clearly providing that key service to drivers of charging is raise the visibility of the system and of the infrastructure. If, if it's not visible, as they say, it's not there. And that's that's not my quote. I believe it might be Ray Kroc from McDonald's, but it's, uh, it's fundamental. It's the same reason why you don't see any petrol stations without canopies. We install full solar canopy. It's, it's recognizable as part of our brand. Obviously, you as a driver, you can navigate to that. Um, you, you don't get lost, not, you don't spend time hunting for that charger or that, that, that charging system. But it's also really valuable because you're driving on the motorway and you see these huge yellow canopies and you go, what's that? What, what's that all about? What might that be? And you, you'll then see them more and more and you'll take the time to start looking around. Another point in, that we, we continue to see in, uh, in the United Kingdom where I am, but also in other markets, is uh, people continue to quote the lack of, of charging infrastructure as one of the main reasons for not adopting electric vehicles. There are perceived issues around range, which are largely disappearing now. So the car that I drive has a range of 240 miles. So that's well over 300 kilometers, let's say. If I drive that far, I need to stop for a toilet break kind of thing. So the range of the vehicle isn't the issue anymore, but the availability of infrastructure can be. Part of that issue is a perception issue. You might, there might be, you know, significant amounts of charging infrastructure in a, in a particular area, but if you can't see it, it's just not there. If you can't see it, you then don't think an electric vehicle is a viable option for you. So Fastnet, we really try to address every element of the challenge and the real and perceived barriers to uptake that the, the charging infrastructure infrastructure part of the, the equation can address. So our infrastructure is highly visible. It's future-proofed. Um, so we install a very large grid connection from day one that enables us to install more and more charges, faster and faster charges as demand increases, as you know, the queue forms, we can literally overnight add another charger. We can upgrade the speed of the charges because the vehicles are modernizing very quickly and they're going to be able to charge much more quickly as well in the future. It's really a tangible asset that is a sign of a behavioral and broader system change for people. It is not the, the small charging in the obscure part of the parking lot, but it's like the major oil petrol station that we are used to see on the highways or on our road. I like the way you have discussed with the solar canopy. It's a clear sign oh, of the renewable and, and also the tangible aspect that people they, they are doing in, in their change. It's clear the range and site is there and the problems. And I like the three pillars, visible, future proof and fast charging. And you said also open all the system. So maybe let's let discuss how it works and for example, if I have a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf or other does. Can I come to charge to your places? I would work. And where do you take your energy? Because that is another uh, very important part. Is it renewable? Is it coming from fossil fuel? Because that is the other important debate. And some critics say we are recharging, but you are taking from the coal power plants. So you are not making any difference. So can you maybe explain, go deeper on that, please? The main thing to describe is the experience of you as a driver when you arrive at Fastnet Station. So there you are, you're driving, you know, your Tesla, you drive your Porsche Taken, you know, these 100,000 euro cars, or you're driving a Nissan Leaf, or you're driving a Honda e, any fully electric vehicle, whatever you drive, you can charge with Fastnet. We are a pure charging company. We only make our profits from selling electricity. We don't sell chargers. We don't sell coffees. With us, it's absolutely transparent with you know what you will pay for your energy, for example. 
And so you'll arrive at our charger and you'll choose the correct plug for your, for your vehicle. And there are still one or two plugs in circulation because the industry is not fully circulate, um, standardized yet. However, we want you, whatever you drive, to fill your vehicle and, and get back on the road. So you instantly insert your plug. And then, of course, you have this question, you know, how do I pay? It's an unmanned facility. We don't have staff on site. You know, there's CCTV surveillance, that sort of thing. But actually, it's all dealt with via, via the charger themselves so you can pay using your your contactless credit card or debit card you can pay with your apple watch or your android phone you can pay with rfid sort of charge cards from other providers we have relationships with at least 25 um, other charge point operators and charge card providers across europe so we have roaming agreements basically just as you would with mobile phones you can use a card from another provider to, to charge at our station because again we need to make it as easy as possible for you to charge then of course we have the fastnet app um, the app is great highly recommended to anybody it's got great functions like route planners and that sort of thing but it's not a mandatory facility but it's there to give you a few additional enhanced value sort of propositions so via the app you can access uh, a subscription which uh, if it works for you in terms of your own personal business case then it's great to use uh, on top of that you can use the auto charge facility and i think this is the most exciting thing about the app and about you know the relationship uh, that you have as a customer with fastned once you're registered on the app our charges will recognize your car wherever you are in the network so you're driving in the uk you're driving in switzerland with us in belgium in the netherlands and germany our charges will recognize your car as soon as you plug in and will start charging your, your vehicle so people often talk about the the experience of a, you know charging at a Tesla station, for example. There, it's all dealt with because yeah, Tesla's charges and over Tesla vehicles, and any billing will be dealt with on a monthly basis. It's just the same with us. And that at this point, when your charging network does that for you, electric vehicle charging just takes another step up over the comfort and experience that you have with a gasoline or or a diesel station. It's so simple, you can forget about it. Your car is dealing with it, and you can now walk and have a cup of coffee for 10, 15 minutes or so before your car's full or before you've got the charge that you need. You know, the average stay time with us is about 15 minutes or so. And depending on the car you drive, you'll get anywhere between, you know, 60 to 80% of your, your vehicle's charge. Point being, we don't care if you drive a car with a slow charge rate or a car with the fastest charge rate on the market, you can get that speed with us um, and get on the go again as quickly as you wish to. That's the, the usage side of things. In terms of our energy supply, as I sort of mentioned before, the solar panels do literally, they're charging your car as you charge. But uh, if you know, depending on how much you know about energy, you recognize that the canopy that you can fit over a, a station like this is not enough to generate the full power or the full energy to fill your vehicle. So we're connected to the grid. We connect at, at least 11,000 volts, which is a sort of medium voltage uh, network, depending on the country you're in, basically. But that has access to multi megawatts of power. And that's what you need to fill lots of cars very quickly, basically. That then, you know, instantaneously speaking, and I think that's, this is always the point, instantaneously you consume energy from the grid and the grid is a mix of, depending on where you are, nuclear power, renewable power, biomass, coal in some countries still, obviously, gas, you name it. So instantaneously, there's a carbon balance that's not zero. At the same time, we have agreements in place with 100% renewable providers that make sure that we're netting off the electricity we buy so that, and, and we, this is also being certified basically, that when you charge with us, you're charging on zero carbon power on a net basis, essentially is the easiest way to describe that. The other point I want to quickly touch on, people say, oh, well, you know, if, if you're driving in Germany or something, for example, at a certain time of day, it's just all coal. Uh, yes, it is all coal, but the beauty of the electric powertrain is it's so efficient that you're still more environmentally friendly or you know your, your carbon emissions are lower than if you were driving with a petrol vehicle now as you'll often hear as well then is you get these questions about what's the you know the life cycle emissions of an electric vehicle and that's a bit different obviously an electric vehicle depending on how it's manufactured it, it generally takes a bit more energy to build a bit more complexity which means that the emissions associated with construction may be 50 percent higher than a petrol car today however life cycle emissions are uh, it balances out very quickly very quickly if you're charging on a low carbon grid or a zero carbon grid like in the uk actually for example we're very low emissions of our electrical infrastructure we have barely any coal on the system anymore for example even if you're on an all carbon grid there there is still an all coal grid there is still a payback there so it's it's not zero sum but yeah i think that there are avenues there that you can sort of go down and keep burrowing down and Obviously, there are a lot of advocates one way or another in, in the industry about these things. And it's, you know, just to get ahead of it as well, like we, we should be under no illusion that uh, every element of the supply chain is magically environmentally beneficial. It's clear that, you know, lithium ion batteries, for example, they consume lithium. Some elements of the powertrain consume rare earth metals, just like mobile phones do. That's definitely something to be aware of. And, and the beauty of it is this yeah, I guess you could say the oil and gas industry got away with it for so long that it's just an accepted fact. But you've got so much more scrutiny now for good and for slightly cynical reasons. But that means that the industry has to step up. The supply chains have to step up. And we have this ability to create as sustainable as possible a supply chain. And 
you know, issues of worker rights, welfare, community impacts are all being raised today. And as the market grows, there will be immense pressure to maintain and continue to improve and all these kinds of things. And the final point to just note on there, what I love is that, you know, you burn fuel in your car, <laughs> you're not catching the, the emissions coming out the back of it. When you use your lithium ion battery, it's rechargeable. So first of all, you know, you're putting in only zero carbon energy. But furthermore, it's like you're able to, well, you, you can recycle it. I think that that's, that's the main point I want to raise there. You can recycle your battery. You can't recycle the, the fuel you've used uh, in, a, in a petrol vehicle. So more and more in the future, we won't be talking about mining new uh, minerals, although I think for the foreseeable future we will. But there is this real opportunity for a closed loop and a truly circular economy with the, in particular, with the electric vehicle industry. Uh, there's, there are real challenges around the, I guess, closing the loop with consumer electronics mobile phones you know you see the amount of those going into landfill and these truly valuable minerals that are just being you know discarded with batteries there's a real opportunity to standardize the manufacture to standardize the recycling processes so that this lithium and these other components continue to add value beyond the life of a single vehicle for example that is really a passionate way you have touched so many points as you summarize this is an industry that is growing now and growing now, as you say, there's a lot of scrutiny and discussion. Of course, some they are genuine discussion. Some are also partisans. Of course, when there is a system change, in another way, people, you know, they try to find flaws. This is also the spirit of this podcast. There is no silver bullet. We cannot say, wonderful, now the electric car will solve all our problems. It is a network engagement. Of course, what you said, it's really important because if we all know that the grid, you cannot choose what you buy, but you can offset and you can have agreements with renewable producer to be sure that at least your amount of energy you offset, what do you buy? And this is, I think, a very good step. Also, with more station to foster also a renewable producer. It's really also interesting what you touch about the circular economy. Because that is, I think, one of the critical limitations. We'll discuss a bit now the challenges and limitations, but it's a critical limitation for the industry. And I was reading on the Financial Times, even yesterday, you know, new startups coming up about, I think it was the former chief engineer of Tesla, Redwood, that is working on how to close the loop and how to recover. Because there are all highly social issues, peace and security issues, because a lot of these minerals are mined in area where instability and violation of human rights are quite widespread and common. We really need to close the loop. Of course, in the foreseeable future, we might need also to mine more and work. Eh? But it's really, in these decades, we all need to work and discuss. I liked also your metaphor. You know, you cannot recycle your fuel but you can recycle your battery. It's really interesting. And going with challenge and limitations a bit, the challenge and limitation, for example, for the development of Fastnet in the future, where do you see it? Which are the critical factors? Yeah, so Fastnet, we're at uh, the moment, certainly, we're a business that serves to uh, provide on-the-go charging. So for us, you know, actually, if we have challenges um, or issues that we wish, wish to address, they're around the locations that we build on. It's, you know, yes, we're an energy company, um, but actually, we interact with the, the real world via real estate. <laughs> For example, we, we identify a location that's going to be attractive to us to, to build one of our facilities. We're competing against Starbucks, for example, in some of these locations. You know, Starbucks um, can pay a lot more rent than a Fastnet can, potentially, depending on you know, various factors. So accessing real estate is a real consideration. Clearly, we're competing with others in the market who have other strategies for how they access land. But in, in general, that's a factor for us. Uh, beyond that, then we, we need permit to build our stations. And this, this comes down to you know the shape of the canopy, the height of the canopy, the way we uh, deal with access arrangements, for example. It's all local specifics, but generally it's quite common in all our markets that we have to get permits. And then, of course, yeah, we need grid connections. And the nice thing about the fast end model is uh, connecting to the, the, the medium voltage or the high voltage grid is where it's not as much of a barrier as some people would uh, have us have you think. It's actually a lot easier to install at that level than it is to install a lot of, a lot of charges at homes, for example, because the local distribution networks in most countries are really quite constrained. And once you've added, you know, three or four charges on the street or maybe 10 charges at home, there can be real challenges on the local capacity level which can then be more expensive or, or more time consuming to, to upgrade or fix. But with the fastest model and, you know, other high power models are out there, of course. I guess the, the challenge is all these elements that I've described, you know, location sourcing, 
uh, permitting grid connections, these all take time. The market is growing very quickly and we are, us and others in the market are rushing to build as much as possible, as quickly as possible. But indeed, there is a, you know, a, a physical constraint on how quickly we can build. That is the challenge. And it, it'll be a similar story for the, the foreseeable future in, in every country, as far as I'm concerned. It'll start, it'll, it'll always start small. Staying within the industry, where is it? Because... How do you see the competition from traditional uh, energy companies, especially the big BMOTs now that are starting to enter the former state uh, electric, which are now setting up stations? How do you see the competition in the market? I think they've got a fascinating challenge. So obviously these are businesses that are used to um, you know, paying out chunky dividends to their shareholders. How do they, for a start, manage this transition uh, to electric mobility, and you, you've seen it. There have been rebrands of Total, for example. You know, regearings and launching of new offerings for consumers from the larger operators, the Shells, the BPs of this world, and they're all trying to understand their position in the market. They're trying to understand, you know, what the business case is for them and how physically and on a sort of more macro level they manage that transition. So, on a local level, the question is, you know, how many charges can I install in my petrol station? Often, the answer is maybe one maybe two, because the footprints are already quite optimized for fueling. At the moment, you generally speaking, don't want to install a, a ignition, potential ignition source. The risk is low, I have to emphasize, but a potential ignition source next to a petrol pump. So how do you manage the, the switch? You know, Do you, in advance, pull out all your cash generating petrol pumps and replace them with uh, EV chargers, which will not give you the same turnover in the early years, for example? Do you try and do it in a phased manner? Do you do it location by location and have a mix? That's a physical challenge to be, to be dealt with. Beyond that, of course, at the organizational level, like what is the significance or the remaining importance of your oil and gas business? The charging business is a whole different story. And what we've seen now as well is that, you know, the operators have started to realize actually their existing locations are not optimal in most locations for, for charging. So they're looking for new land. They're looking for new places to build, <laughs> indeed, just as we are. So they're coming across all the problems that we've been coming across for years now as well and seeing how they deal with that how they engage with that and what their offer is for customers. But it's all good, end of the day. What it means is more charges for drivers and more parties sticking down more charges. It means competition. It means, yeah, the infrastructure can, will continue to chase growth of the EVs. And at the moment, when you've got basically every major car manufacturer committing to phasing out internal combustion engines by you know roughly 2030 now, we're seeing obviously Mercedes, Volvo, uh, Volkswagen Group, these are the world's biggest car manufacturers, basically. They've, they've seen the writing on the wall. They've seen the superior experience you get as a driver in an electric car. They've seen the other future added value benefits that they can sort of layer on top of the experience. So it's a really exciting time, basically. Definitely. It's really important. And you see, with the pressure of regulators and the pressure of people, and especially, you know, the fact now that the time is, we are no longer in the 70s when the debate started about the planetary boundaries. We are now approaching the boundaries. And we have seen in this summer of uh, cold and floods or fire in other places. So it's really the climate change is with us. And being with us, I want to take you globally because as for the vaccines, the debate is now raging for the vaccines and everything. How, we, of course, some of the solutions are for more developed economy, for economy that can pay. And we are talking about the traditional North America, the traditional Europe, and of course, the Asian market, which they have already high level of income and they can, of course, offer company like you and manufacturer of electric vehicles returns for their shareholder. But we have billions of people living in what is the global south, which as well, they are now approaching, they are growing very fast and they are approaching the mobility revolution. Because as we know, as was the case in the 1950 or 60 in our countries, in Europe or in Asia, a bit later, mobility and rise of income came with cars. And there is a scramble even in Kenya where I am of some car manufacturers and people targeting the middle class. So how we can really avoid uh, going the same steps and leapfrog towards building the infrastructure for sustainable mobility in the emerging market? That's exactly the right question. Um, and it's something that's been on my mind for a long time. In general, I think the idea of leapfrogging is fundamental. Uh, as we saw with the emerging you know, mobile phones, mobile phone networks in developing countries, in Africa, in India, for example, it's 
delivered huge economic and social benefits across those countries. And I would hope and I see no reason why infrastructure and obviously mobility means that are actually in many ways superior to the traditional fossil fuel alternatives can't be leapfrogged in the same way. It can't be used for the, as a basis for leapfrogging. The main role for emerging markets initially is to help drive down the costs, is to help increase manufacturing capacity and move to a point where there is a model of you know an archetype of vehicle that's affordable for all in existing markets, but also then in, in, in developing markets, where, as you say, you've got this emerging middle class that is then looking for their first vehicle. That is an area of great importance, basically. On the charging side, I would love to explore more in the future about how, just as you can have mobile base stations for mobile phones that you know effectively run off a little bit of solar power and a battery, and therefore open up the whole rural microgrids, for example, and, and rural phone networks, I, I see no reason why in the more remote settings, we can't be looking at a remote off-grid solution that couples both solar plus storage uh, to offer charging, you know, at whatever speed it may be, but that enables people to make journeys that would previously have been impossible with anything other than a, an internal combustion engine vehicle. It can be done at a different scale. Expectations will be different, sort of consumer expectations or end user expectations. That's got to be a key part of the story. But it's an area where I hope that, you know, these new user groups will continue to innovate. Entrepreneurs will come in their respective markets who understand the mobility needs of their drivers. It's so easy for me to say, oh, I think it's going to be like this. I am definitely under no illusions. I have, I'm, you know, unfortunately not the faintest clue of how, of the mobility needs, the actual needs, you know, the journey needs that you as a user have in many of these other countries. That is where local experts, local participants across the, the, the stakeholder environment come in and, and can take this technology, which fundamentally is so simple it's a battery and electric motor and roll that out at scale um with a in a form that you know is just not on the mind of someone like myself who is not in touch with as i say that the needs and the challenges that users have in those markets i think it's gonna be really exciting to see what comes up because like, like i say you can use a chassis of a basic car you can bung some batteries on the back of it you can stick in a, you know, an ac or a dc synchronous motor whatever it might be and that is an electric vehicle it doesn't need to drive 200 miles an hour it doesn't need to charge at 300 kilowatts it can be a lot more simple if necessary if the needs of you as a driver the needs of your neighborhood perhaps whatever it might be don't require those levels of performance because what you've got is mobility and that's got to be the hopefully the starting point for any you know sort of emerging business model in these markets as you say raising up and, and getting to the point of uh, you know middle income and therefore the mobility needs that evolve with that you are discussing in my mind a lot of opportunity comes because there is a huge, a vast opportunity to build up a new network, to build up a future-proof mobility as well in emerging markets, avoiding the mistakes. And some of these megalopolis of the future, they are, you know, I'm thinking of the Nairobi, the city in South America or in India. They are already grappling with the issue of the eye pollution and uh, increase of uh, diseases like cancer and, and others because of the pollution. So it's really a challenge that is there and charging as well, coupled with, of course, the entrepreneur and the innovation on vehicles, I think is where we need really to look to avoid like we have cleaned the road of UK, but but, you know, in Nairobi, we have millions of all diesel cars uh, moving around, which is really not ethical. Yes. You say repeating the mistakes, and I think I, it, it's actually important to go in another level. Why should it be just replacing the petrol car with a, an electric car? Like we've, we've got the technology again. It's called mass transit. It's called it's buses, it's trains, it's bus rapid transit and trams. When we talk about dealing with these issues of air quality, we talk about climate change and you know mobility. What we don't want to see, frankly, is a world where it's a one-for-one -one replacement of a petrol car with, a, with an electric car. That doesn't solve our, our challenges. And I, you know, in my previous job, I was looking at the modeling for this on a, on a climate level, on an embodied construction uh, emissions level. We don't get there by just changing everything uh, for electric, uh, let's say. We need to look at mass transit. We need to look at changing aspirations around these kinds of things. Clearly, there is an element of freedom about the personal car. And that is, I, I can totally relate to that. At the same time, you're talking at the metropolises of the future, megalopoli, the mega cities of today, the mega cities of the future of which, you know, they're growing and they're adding and increasing in number all the time. This shouldn't be a personal transit story. This should be a mass transit story. And that can be electrified readily. The draw on our raw materials and minerals will be less if we reduce the number of vehicles and switch them all into mass transit. There are so many benefits out there. And then, of course, we've got this another other element that's sort of sitting on the horizon, which is shared mobility. It's uh, autonomous vehicles. 
depending on how that goes, again, that will change your relationship with the private vehicle. You don't need to own this asset that sat there in your driveway, but depreciating, losing value, deteriorating, not in use for 90% of the day. You will hopefully just, you know, flick on your phone or your, your system will just know intuitively that you want to have a ride in whatever fancy subscription model car that you now uh, have access to. Instantly, we move to the United Kingdom, for example, we have 33 million petrol and diesel cars. I don't see a world where it's 33 million electric cars. I see it being half, 25%, maybe even, who knows? Um, but that, that's, you know, that's the way I hope it goes. That's the way it needs to go because the resource uh, consumption, the, the time it'll take to make that kind of transition, we, you know, we're not going to be able to meet our global goals and, and deal with the, the climate emergency. That is a really important point. It's actually, it's working towards a new model and a new system. And we are, as you touch the point of shared vehicle and autonomous driving, that is as well. Of course, now they are still in infancy and there's still a lot of uh, technological innovation needed, but they can solve the problem. And especially a big change should be a behavioral change. You know, one of the way to get recognition by especially your peers and your neighborhood that you have made it you have now reached the middle income is of course getting a car and i see it every day for example even with people here in kenya when they reach then of course they buy the car and they put it in front of the yard and all the neighbor come to see and greet you know especially in the rural area of course in nairobi now has become common but in the rural area is still is still part and it's really something that, of course, needs to change. And especially we need to enable to change in a way that this serves the needs of the customer or the people, wherever they are, in, in UK, in Russia, in Japan, in Australia, or whatever. Tom, I, since we have discussed a very interesting topic, I'm really happy. I will usually finish the podcast with a message, a message for the audience, a message from Tom to the people that listen to the podcast, which is your message. If we're dealing with the short term, it's about making electric vehicles a thing and pushing that forward. And I would urge everyone in the audience who hasn't yet sat in an electric vehicle to take one for a test drive, get a friend to drive them, whatever it might be, because that's the single biggest barrier. You don't appreciate the improvement that this vehicle offers uh, to your, your driving experience. And it, it all becomes clear the second you sit in it, the second you accelerate away, the smoothness, the quietness, the instant acceleration, depending on you know your drivers as a, as a car user, get an electric car, check it, then say it's not going to be a thing. <laughs> that is, as you see, a tangible asset, a tangible to win, and you know how to change also your perspective. That is a very strong message, and we urge people as well to be part of the transformation within this decade. Tom, I really want to appreciate, I really want to thank you because you have giving us a wonderful episode it's been a pleasure for me to have you thank you tom thank you so much Samuel. thank you wonderful episode are you satisfied after this wonderful episode in the next one we will go to the academia 